Hi, I'm Peter Mezzett, host of Great Gardens. On today's show, we're going to talk about legacy trees. What do legacy trees mean? Well, we'll find out by going and seeing my legacy tree with my father uh, in my uh, yard, in my house that I grew up with. And after that, we'll talk about legacy trees and uh, what they look like when people come into the garden center at Western Nurseries and purchase them. And then we'll really dig in and say what legacy trees really are to people. And they are things, they are trees that symbolize an important event in somebody's life or uh, an important person in somebody's life in some, in some way. So let's go take a look at some of the mature trees where I grew up uh, with my father. Well, you talk about trees that bring back memories and legacy trees. I'm here with Wayne Mezzett, my father. And this is the ultimate tree for me that brings back memories from my childhood. This tree right here, uh, which is a tricolor beech, planted how long ago? My grandfather, your great-grandfather, planted this in 1950 when he moved into this house. Of course, the house looked a lot different back then. We've done some renovations to it, but so does the tree. My uh, recollection is that this tree was about 10 feet tall and about as big as my thumb <laughs> when it was planted here. In fact, I think I've got a picture of it. We'll, we'll, we'll have take to a look show at that. it. Yeah. But he, he liked this tree because it had the foliage that was different. We bought it from, my recollection is he bought it from Holland and they're grafting trees, unusual trees over there. So we wanted to grow some in the nursery and he thought this would be a good one to plant in his front yard. And beech are very majestic trees in general, and they live a long time. When I was a kid, I remember not this big, but I remember maybe this big or this big around. And I remember this branch right here that we had a swing on it, and we used to climb right up it right. in this tree. Yeah, we just took that off a, a couple of years ago because it was getting hanging a little bit low. We wanted to get more light under here. but And it's also it's getting so big at this point that it becomes the major piece in front of the house. So we wanted to make sure that we could see the house through it. Right. And I love the gnarly branches you get with the beech tree. And you can see it was very good for climbing. Still is if I could jump that high. <laughs> but I'm sure my uh, sisters and brother also remember a lot about this tree growing oh, yeah. up. And it really is uh, uh, one of the things that it, it just it, it grounds you back to your you used to, the place where I you grew up. I remember your kids used to play under the, underneath the tree. We had a lawn there. It's getting dark. You can see we've now planted a, pa a pack of Cassandra ground cover under here because it's really too dark for a lawn to grow successfully. Mm -hmm. But you, we used to play out here in the summertime. It was cool. A lot, a lot of fun. Sprinkler going. Right. It was great. Right. Well, this tree does bring back a lot of memories, but there's some other trees right around here, too, that are kind of legacy trees in their yeah. own right. This, this, Very majestic. This Japanese cut leaf maple over here is one that we... Um, it's not quite as old as the beech tree, but we moved this here. Your mother and I moved this this tree here 25 or 30 years ago, and it was still pretty big at that point. But I'd say this tree is probably about 50 years old right now. Wow! And then there and the, again, the, the gnarly branch, branch is, structure underneath there. And in the winter time, this is just fantastic. You should see it as the when the leaves come off, you can see the. The, the structure of the branches and the snow sitting on it and the ground cover is evergreen underneath. It really looks neat. Yeah, yeah. We've got some lighting that, that shines up through it too so that the branches are illuminated. Oh, that's great. And I know you prune it quite often too because you do want to show that interesting branch structure. And this is at its ultimate height, maybe around 10 feet right now. It's not going to get much taller, but we, um, we, we like to keep it so you can see through it. It's, but it really means a lot to us. And the beech tree gets about probably 50, 60 feet tall. I would say 75 feet tall, yeah. eventually. Yeah, yeah. So two different types of trees that uh, will live a long time and, yeah. and can, can be considered, and considered legacy trees. There's one more over here that we ought to take a look at, too. Oh, all right, let's go do that. This, this is a, the Japanese stewardia that we planted here. Oh, gosh, this had to be 30 years ago. But you can see how much slower this one is, has grown than the other ones. We, had, we planted this here when Stephen Sponberg from the Arnold Arboretum identified the cultivar as Korean Splendor. Mm -hmm. And you can see from the bark that it's got that fabulous exfoliating bark that looks good summertime, of course, but especially in the wintertime against the snow. It's now developing the fall foliage, which is orange 
and yellow and red. Mm -hmm. And in the springtime, actually in late spring, it gets these white flowers that look like a camellia. I've seen them. They, they all drop down and they end up and they land, face up. land face up, right. which is a fabulous uh, presentation that they make, it, much different from any other tree I know. So this I've seen uh, as a, a key plant in many people's landscapes, and you'd consider that another tree that would be a legacy tree. It's a very a long, long time. It's a very long live tree, and as it grows, it's upright when it's young. It spreads out, and it's a magnificent tree, especially if you keep the branches so that you can see them in the winter time. So Stuardia, Stuardia pseudo camellia. Pseudo camellia is it's the botanical a ja name. Japanese Stuardia is a good name. Japanese Stuardia. Yeah. Yeah. Great and specimen. Thanks. All right. Well, while we're in your yard here, we may as well keep looking at legacy trees. You've got some unbelievable mature specimens, and uh, we're standing by one. This is a red oak, right? This is red oak, and again, it's about 50 or 60 years old. Uh, it's been planted here and limbed up so that we can see the, the whole trunk of it mm -hmm. and also so that we can grow other plants underneath it because it gives high shade when it's limbed up like that. What's this big leaf uh, tree right over here? That's big leaf magnolia. Look at the leaves on it. I mean, they're, they're literally two feet, two feet long. Two feet long. Yeah. And the flowers, when they bloom, are about a foot in diameter in June. So wow. again, wow. that could be a legacy tree too, a long live tree understory tree, so it'll take a little bit of shade mm -hmm. or high light like here. Mm -hmm. But the red oak is, any of the oaks are fabulous. In fact, there's the white oak over here that we ought to look at yep. while we're talking about oaks. Oh this, yeah, this is a beauty. Well, this is what people think of when they, when they see an oak tree. They think of the wide spreading tree, whereas the red oak being up, more upright, it'll eventually spread. This one spreads even when it's very young. Look at the branch structure and look at the thickness of the trunk. How old is this tree? It's about the same age as the red oak. It's just uh, maybe it's in a little bit better soil here. You can see it's a little bit in the, in the landscape and it hasn't been pruned up as high. Yeah, uh, it's very widespread and majestic too. So two other great choices for legacy trees that people could, could consider. Uh, absolutely. All right, well, we're going to go on to our next segment now and talk more about other trees that we can show uh, the viewers in terms of you know smaller trees that are for sale now that will turn into something like this. So Great. let's go take a look at those. So we're here at the garden center now. We're looking at a whole bunch of beech around us, and you got weeping types and upright types. But up ahead is the tricolor beech, I, same I one we I just saw, talked about. I think I saw one here, about the same size as the one that we put in at. Um, my grandfather, or the, he put in back in, the, in 1950. Look at the size of this one compared to the, the one we just looked at. Yep, yep. So the beech typically are slow growers initially, but once they get established in the ground, they grow quite quickly, don't they? They do. This is probably 10 years old from a graft, and it has, as you can see, it hasn't been pruned up very much. Mm -hmm. It's beginning to spread out at the top. You can see the last couple of years' growth have been a little bit longer. When it gets in the ground, it'll um, get established and then really take off. And I think what people need to know is typically when you do buy a plant that's just been harvested and the roots have been cut off, typically you're cutting about 80% of those roots and the first year after in the ground it will grow a little slower but then the second and the third year it really gets going. The typical, the, the, the general rule is it takes a year every inch of stem diameter. So a two inch caliper tree or an inch and a half will take a year or two to get established and then it, it feels at home. So that's a good before and after shot in a sense. That's right. Let's look at another tree in fact, right over here. Yeah, that's right. We're going to look at the Stuardia that is about the same thing. This so we looked at the mature specimen at your house and here's one that uh, somebody could purchase at their local garden center. Again, this is probably about 10 years old from a cutting this time or, or seed not grafted and um, it's um, you, you see the bark is beginning to, to exfoliate it's beginning right. to, to, to look nice but uh, it's nowhere near the size of the other one we just looked at right and you see the foliage is a little further along in terms of its color again because the plant has just been harvested it moves along a little differently than it does once it's set into the, the landscape right and a flowering tree like this doesn't flower as heavily when it's young but it does flower and uh, it's 
this is a good, a good starter tree. In a couple of years, it'll, it'll really start to spread out. Great. And I think we can go look at an oak, too. So let's go look at the, right. the oak trees we have. Sure. Now, th those mature trees we just looked at were naturally uh, grown seedlings that just occurred in the landscape. The oaks. The oak trees. And these are the oaks that you can buy in the, in the garden center now, which are a little, little bit different, but have the same, a similar growth habit. Different variety. This one I see is uh, the scarlet oak. This is scarlet, very similar to the pin oak. And it's got the same fall color as the red oak, but it, it grows a little bit differently. And then this one over here is a swamp, swamp white oak, which is a, a, a little bit easier to transplant than the, than the regular white oak. But that's what's generally available. Right. And would you say these are improved cultivars? They certainly do better. Um, they're the ones that you can get at the garden center, and they do very well in the landscape. So yeah, they're excellent for a legacy tree. OK, great. I'm standing beneath a tulip tree, Liriodendron tulip, tulip fair is the botanical name, that uh, we planted about seven or eight years ago uh, as a uh, memorial for somebody who was a teacher at Center School for 30 years, Mrs. Geneseo, Karen Geneseo. And so uh, I grew up in this town. A lot of my siblings uh, had her as a teacher, a few of my siblings. And I felt really good about the fact that the Center School principal wanted to plant a tree uh, in dedication of her 30 years of service. So this is a tulip tree. When we planted it, it was probably about two and a half inch diameter, and you can see in seven or eight years, it's a fast grower. It's about 12 inches in diameter. Now, the tulip tree has the nice shaped leaves that kind of looks like a big mitten, uh, like a maple tree with the end cut off, and it grows very straight. So this is a very majestic tree, a uh, good one to consider for a legacy tree planting, and an actual example of how it happens here at the Common in Hopkinton. Legacy trees are one thing, but there's also legacy gardens. And uh, also here on the common, right across the way from uh, the tree that we planted for Mrs. Geneseo in her retirement, uh, is the gazebo. And you can see kind of a memorial garden that we planted a couple of years ago. And the gazebo, of course, recognizes those who fought in battles to preserve the freedom of our nation. So once again, our company is very happy to participate with uh, the donation of the plant material around this new gazebo which was all paid for on uh, raised money. Uh, it was a very successful campaign driven by uh, a bunch of people in town here. So you can see another example of legacy or memorial planting. In this case, we're using rhododendrons, large leaf rhododendrons that bloom in May, small leaf rhododendrons that bloom in April. And there's a few summer blooming azaleas along the entrances that bloom into June. So you have kind of a continuous bloom period in this garden. Hi, we're here with John Moretti, who's head of horticultural sales in uh, the garden center at Weston Nurseries. And John has a lot of years of experience with uh, assisting customers coming in and a lot of experience with people who come in for that special tree, which we're talking about legacy trees. And John, why don't you share some stories of what some of the people who have come in are looking for, for a, a tree that represents uh, an important event or important situation in somebody's life. Okay, we do get uh, a lot of requests. Uh, people like to mark anniversaries and birth dates and um, as tributes to loved ones and this sort of thing. We also have people who are interested in planting tree as a legacy, not just to their family, but maybe as a gift to future generations. And we consider that a legacy tree. Um, birth I, of a child. Definitely birth know, of a child. Big one. Um, watching the tree grow and develop as the children grow is, I think, is a fun thing. Uh, people look at trees not just as, as functional elements in the landscape. Uh, certainly they, they provide shade and um, can add value to the real estate and um, purify the air and, uh, you know, structurally are interesting. But I think people also like to, to use those trees as sort of uh, historical markers 
in their family life. And uh, they watch a young child grow and develop, and uh, the tree does as well. And I think it, uh, it's a lot of fun, in, in addition to, to being to having some historical value. Right. We spoke about my legacy tree with my dad. and. It was a big beech tree and it's grown up through the years and I always see that and I always remember what I used to do around it sure. or swing on it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's very popular too. I've had some experience here with people coming in and they do buy, people will buy trees for each of their children sure. and watch them grow up. In this day and age when people move, is it still a popular thing to do? People don't think they're going to stay in the same yeah, house? Yeah, people, very few people of course stay in the same house probably more than five or six years. But I think they see some value in, in planting trees as a as a permanent marker of, of, of their contribution, of their um, care of the land when they were there. And, as, and that tree, and everybody has done this, I've done it, gone back to homes that I've owned previously, mm -hmm. and looked at the landscaping and looked at those special trees, and uh, been very proud of that, that contribution that made to ecologically uh, sound and sensitive way of, of, of um, taking care of that property. And, and so. it's a living thing and it's almost, it can be looked at spiritually as well. I think so. I think uh, people enjoy that idea that, that the landscape outlives them. And yeah. uh, we've all owned homes where mature landscaping has existed. And I always wonder when I look at large trees in the landscape, what was the motivation for planting that tree? I mean, somebody had a great idea. They were standing in front of a magnificent tree right here. Right. Uh, you have a magnificent beech tree in the yard. Well someone to thank who came before you, who right. had the foresight to plant that tree, not just for his own enjoyment, but for future generations as well. So it's the younger generation, in some cases, looking at the previous generation, doing something nice for them as that person gets older, too. Kind of works both ways. I think so. Yeah. That's right. We've seen a lot of uh, uh, legacy trees planted in public areas, too. Mm -hmm. uh, we were up on the common. So I think that's a popular thing, is to put something in remembrance of somebody or to represent somebody in some way in a, in a public area. I know around Hopkinton we see a few examples of that too. You see that? People coming in and wanting to plant something in a public area as well? Uh, not too often. We'll get calls sometimes from towns where that request has been made. Um, I think people look at these trees uh, as not so much as their personal dedication, but something that they enjoy doing and that future generations will come to enjoy. I mean, there are many legacy trees. By legacy tree, I mean, sort of a loose term. I mean, I've always thought of a legacy tree, technically, what is it? It's a, it's a, a gift or a bequest. That's what a legacy mm -hmm. is. Mm -hmm. And when we leave a tree, uh, there are many of them in the landscape for us to enjoy now, like at Mount Auburn Cemetery and, and in these public gardens. Right. I mean, these are trees, I mean, typically, what would qualify as a legacy tree? I always think of trees that either have um, would be long lived. They should be durable trees. They need to be um, low maintenance. They don't, shouldn't have a lot of insect and disease problems. Uh, they should have some kind of uh, majesty to them. Right. Uh, some structure. Uh, hopefully, multiple seasons of interest. interest All of these the things idea. play into it. But you know, the, the large legacy trees. You know, it, it either I think it boils down to either they they'll grow to some tremendous size that will impress us or uh, certainly will live a long time. I mean, the, the famous uh, charter oak is an interesting tree down Connecticut. in Connecticut outside of Hartford. Right. Right. was uh, reputed to have lived 600 years before its demise. Oh my gosh. And uh, I came up from Maryland. Down in Maryland, the unofficial state tree was, was the Y oak. Now the Y oak had a, a, a circumference of over 32 feet. And on the east coast, reputed. yes, yeah. there's a white oak trees in, that in, in Y Mills. Now that tree uh, blew down in a storm about 10 years ago, but uh, was perpetuated through some uh, grafting that had taken off the right. tree. And now there are now two Y oaks growing down on that right. on that same property. But there's a tree that you know, by virtue of just of its of its size alone, was impressive. Right. And, and you've mentioned a couple of public places, but Mount Auburn is an absolute gem of a place to go see some legacy trees. And Tower Hill is probably worth mentioning too. And I do know at Tower Hill that people will buy, as a gift to Tower Hill, a legacy, not only a tree, but a bench or something like that with a plaque on it. So you can walk around the grounds of the 180 acre site mm -hmm. and see all these commemorative gifts that people have left behind. And oftentimes it's legacy to remember somebody too. Yeah, they have uh, one of the best collections of, of some of the unusual trees too. A legacy tree doesn't always have to be a beech tree or a sugar maple or right. 
uh, sometimes unusual trees make great legacy trees. And um, by virtue of the fact of being rare in the landscape, I think some of these trees become right. legacy trees. Right. Like, uh, one of my favorites is Dawn Redwood, which I think is a, that's a long live tree that is very rarely planted and yet does very well in this area. Right, and, right. Uh, or Taxodium. Taxodium, yeah. Which uh, is exactly. currently available at Western Nursery. Yes, it is. <laughs> well, John, thanks for your insight. And um, if you do get a chance, the viewers should go check out Tower Hill and Mount Auburn. I think those are two uh, prime examples. Also, right around here at Western Nurseries, we're standing in front of a Stewardia, which can be considered a nice legacy tree. And, Around us, we'll do some quick shots in a minute here of uh, 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 Tortulosa Beach, Tortulosa Beach, Tortulosa right. Beach yep. as well as the uh, the giant Sergeant Hemlock over there. So again, John, thank you for your time. Okay, we'll My see pleasure. you next time. Okay, all right. And now we're going to introduce you to a brand new part of the Great Garden Show called Did You Know? And Did You Know is going to feature Ann Wells, our horticultural help person at Western Nurseries, who's terrific and knows everything you can imagine about horticulture. Today she'll talk about the difference between maple trees that you see every day in the landscape. The sugar maple, the red maple, and the Norway maple. And we always want to talk about things that you see every day and you have questions about. So if you have questions, please contact us at HCAM and we'll try to have Ann answer them on future shows. Hi, I'm Ann Wells and today I've been asked to identify for you three of the basic trees that we see in the New England landscape all of the time and show you the differences so that you can tell which is which out in the wild and woolly world. Um, as you notice, I've got three sets of leaves here, three twigs. These are Norway maple, very popular, especially during the 40s and 50s as a street tree. Red maple, which is a native, and sugar maple, which is also a native. So if we look at just the really uh, basic characteristics, five lobes, one, two, three, four, five. Three lobes for the red maple, R-E-D, three lobes, R-E-D. And for sugar, one, two, three, four, five. Let's talk about red maple first. Right now, this leaf hasn't turned color yet, but you can see the red on this stem. That's very distinctive of a red maple. There are other three lobe leaves that are somewhat like this, but this red stem says red maple, screams red maple, and eventually this leaf will scream that same red color. Unbelievably beautiful in the landscape. Native, likes damp soils. The buds on this, tend to be in clusters, little bumps. This actually, because the weather's been so weird this year, shows some of the flower buds coming for next year's flowers. that have already swelled, gotten quite large. Here are the two that people most easily confuse because they both have five lobes. But you can see right off the bat that there's one big difference here. Sugar maples are already going this glorious color that is known for. They go from this orange yellow to a much more red orange. They never get into the deep, deep red always within this sort of orange, orange, yellow range. With the Norway maple, which is considered an invasive in Massachusetts, you can no longer propagate it or sell it. This turns yellow or yellow or yellow. It's really pretty boring. So another way to tell if you're concerned about having these in your yard, but a definitive test is to snap the stem and I think you can see it. There's just a little bit of oozing white sap that comes out. And that only is in a Norway maple. Next test, you got trees, but they have no leaves on them. How do you tell? Norway maple has a blunt, rounded tip. Big, blunt tip. Sugar maple, our native, the one that gives the real color, is a great tree. It is this very pointed bud, extremely pointed. Not at all blunt. If I hold them side by side, probably better to put it on the paper for you to see. Just a very, very different shape. So if it's what you're going for, go for sugar. If you like yellow, Norway is fine. If you're looking for something that's a really deep, brilliant, bright red, just like this stem, then what you're looking for is a red maple. And that's the difference between three of our basic maples in New England. Well, thank you for watching today's show on Legacy Trees. I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to cover a wide range of topics in the future, and if you have a topic you'd like us to cover, 
please visit the HKM website and send us an email. Again, hope you enjoyed the show and we'll see you next time. difference, oh boy, in your eyes, because eyes don't lie, no baby eyes don't lie, oh now the eyes don't lie.